Hey YouTubers, good morning, Rob Moffitt. Today, guys, we're, we're doing a book review. Uh, this is Mr. Rawls' book, The Ultimate Pe Pepper's uh, Survival Guide. Um, in fairness, I have to tell you, I did not pay for this book. I asked Mr. Rawls if he would send me a copy because I knew he was uh, going to have it come out on October 20th. It's already available in Costco, but right now you won't be able to get it until October 20th on Amazon. I'll leave a link to it in my uh, video description. But uh, I've been reading the survival blog by Mr. Rawls every day for years. He started the survival blog, I think back in 2005. And it's something that I read religiously every single morning because there's so much good information there about economics, all sorts of things you don't find in the regular news. And he's written several fiction books that are on the bestsellers, the New York Times bestsellers list. And he has a couple of uh, survival fic or nonfiction books that I have not read yet that I'm going to get. I'm going to buy it myself and review them later. Um, but he comes to this, the survival and the prepper field uh, <laughs> with a lot of qualifications, more so than anybody I can think of. Um, I can't recommend the site more highly. It's uh, one of my favorite things to read in the morning. But he's written this book called The Ultimate Prepper Survival Guide. And he uh, politely, uh, graciously sent this to me to review. So we're, we're going to review it this morning. Um, my first impressions, I, I wasn't too happy. Um, it, uh, the title says The Ultimate <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. How can you have the ultimate? I mean, better than any... For example, here's a book I have. The first prepper book I ever got, Passport to Survival by Esther Dickey. It covers food, one subject. And in, in food, it only covers four foods. Uh, salt, honey, powdered milk, and wheat. <laughs> the whole book. Four foods. <laughs> this is the ultimate? So, like, no, I can't be the ultimate. If you fill up the room, you still wouldn't have the ultimate book because the subject is so giant. So, uh, I was kind of taken back by that, that ultimate. But that, that's, I guess, marketing. And also, when I saw the way that they had bound the book, it's it's got the hard cover, which is okay. And it does have the, the this binding that allows you to open the pages, which is great for, like, cookbooks and so on. But it has all these dividers... To me, that just says you're padding. And I, I was I prepared to dislike the book um, without having uh, read it or even opened it up. And uh, But fortunately, <laughs> the more I read, the more I like it. Now, one of the things I want you to know, I think you're going to like this book, but also when you read it again, you're going to like it even better. Because at first glance, if you go through it uh, quickly, a lot of the information maybe you've you've known before, or maybe it may not be as in-depth as you think. But when you go back and read it again, a lot of it, there's... It, it's it's condensed. He doesn't go belabor the point or try to pad his writing. He says something, and, and, and he doesn't have to explain it ten times like a lot of authors do. So it, it's... I think it's, it's worth reading more than once. There's a lot of good information in here that you might skip over and not realize. But let's get down to the review. By the way, I have on my uh, eBay site, uh, I sell some CDs that have Prepper books in them. So you may be, I'll leave a link to the video I did about my CDs I sell on eBay that cover prepping. You might be interested too. So let's get into his book. Now, uh... The introduction here, I noticed he says that I have not written this book at the beginner level. I'm assuming that you have common sense and know the basics of everyday things such as cooking, cleaning, and so on, and hand tools. In, in uh, general, my interest or intent with this book is for it to cover the topics that all of the extent, survival, and preparedness books gloss over or skip entirely. I have to disagree. He, he said he did not write this book at the beginner level level. That might m let people think that this is not for beginners. I I think this is an excellent book for beginners. You wouldn't want to start with this book if you're a beginner, but there's nothing in here that a beginner would not benefit by reading. Uh, nothing at all. Um, but I guess what he's saying, it's not at the beginner level of, of, of reading, but, but as far as the information, 
there's no beginner that would not benefit from anything in this book. So the very first chapter, he starts with the, the world's population and an explosion. Uh, 7.8 billion, that's our total population right now on the world. And he goes over in this chapter the risk. And he just breaks them down. And then uh, this sentence right here, too little for too many. Basically, that's what prepar preparation and survival comes down to. You you don't have enough air, food, water, <laughs> uh, guns or places to be safe or, or places to have income. Uh, you know, that's what it comes down. It's a lack of a resource or, or a, a place to, to live with your family. So uh, that's what it all comes down to. But he goes over economic collapse, the natural re uh, disasters, uh, coming life age, which is fascinating, famine and in invasion, fearful masters, that's interesting, nuclear warfare, calculated control, artificial intelligence, and sovereign e-currencies. Artificial intelligence uh, is fascinating. Right now I've been reading or listening to Scott Adams on his Periscope every day. And he talks about how we may right now be controlled by artificial intelligence it's according to uh, the different uh, persuasion techniques that the, the tech, uh, technology uh, social media people have. Um, it's, it's fascinating. And pandemics, which we're sort of in the middle right now. Um, so there, there is something I, I thought that was when, when he talks about too little for too many. He talks about the world population and how, like in 2050, we could have 9.7 billion people. I do wish he had mentioned where those extra people are coming from, because almost, well, I, not almost every single Western white country, they have a birth rate that's below replacement level. And at the same time, they have immigration policy that is allowing the country to be flooded by people from other countries. But you have like China and Japan, they also have a, a, a falling population, but they don't allow immigration. And those countries are always going to stay Japanese and Chinese, where the Western white countries are filling up with immigrants from other countries. And they're going to be changed dramatically. The ethnographic and demographic changes are going to be calamitous. Um, so I wish he had mentioned the fact that there is going to be a large population increase, but it's not coming <laughs> from Western countries or China or Japan. It's coming from other countries. Primarily, Africa is going to have the largest increase, which is really insane because even countries like Bangladesh reduced their population growth to where they have just replacement level. So the, the, these countries in Africa are going to have to export all their uh, people because they won't have enough food or water resources or opportunities and it's going to be interesting uh, to see what happens but I, I, I asked one thing I wish he had talked about uh, he, he didn't mention where the populations are coming from um, this part the threat matrix I thought was one of the best parts of his whole book because it gets you to personally figure out what is the things that you need to survive what what things are threatening you <laughs> if, you, if you're George Soros or Bill Gates, you may have a different threat matrix than if you're Joe Sixpack. Um, I thought about to myself, threat matrix. Threat matrix at the top is a high probability of happening, bottom very low probability of happening. This side of the matrix, it's going to kill you. This side, it's trivial. So what things are most likely to kill me, and it's highly likely... Well, it's not really earthquakes or tsunamis or uh, tidal waves or social unrest. It's cancer or <laughs> heart disease. So <laughs> it's right up here in the core. Maybe, maybe a little bit over here. Not completely lethal, but um, so what I should be working on, since no other survival uh, thing in my matrix matches those things for my health and age, I should be making sure I eat right, exercise lower my stress, and uh, develop strong relationships with people in my family and community and so on. So that's <laughs> this matrix is something that everybody in the world could use. Um, figuring out what is most likely to come after you, um, you can work on it. Because um, you may find out that 
maybe some of the things you're preparing for and you're buying your guns and ammo and 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 food and and, and repairing your home where where you end up you should have gotten a checkup and seen the doctor <laughs> uh, now the next section which i think is interesting how he preceded this uh, before things most people think of pre preparing and surviving, they think about guns, ammo, food, water. He talks about mentality, and that's such a, an important part of surviving, is you need to have a reason to survive. I think Abraham Maslow, he was in the concentration camps. He discovered that the prisoners who survived the longest were those who had a reason to live. They had something to go back home for. They had really strong family ties or religious ties, or they believed in something strongly enough for them to uh, get through terrible, terrible things. And and having a strong mentality is very important. Um, he talks about different things to help prepare. Um, the essentials, he goes over water. I wish, to me, water is civilization. Clean running water, it starts with, with water. Um, I wish he had gone over water just a little bit more than he did. Um, protection is the most popular part of surviving and prepping uh, because it involves buying things. <laughs> we all think we can buy our way out of <laughs> the future. <laughs> wish it was so. Um, but this is a very good chapter. I, I really, the house hardening and night vision, you can learn a lot from this information here. I thought it was very well done. Um, now, your neighbors, you, you, uh, you don't live in a shack in the wilderness all by yourself. You live in the world, in, in a society. Um, we have a social contract, and, and dealing with, with your neighbors is a big part of survival. Um, in the end, we'll talk about more about that. Um, now, there is one thing he mentioned. I'm a nitpicker, and I? I tell you, I, I'm, I'm finding things. He talks about here, which he says... Stay vocal. He says, I must urge you to not feel buffaloed into silence. If we allow ourselves to be frightened into political inactivity and gray man obscurity, then the tyrannical status opponents of liberty will have won. Silence is tacit consent. But then down here he says, keep in mind that the tech giants control the Internet and that the Internet is now the linchpin of 21st century public discourse. Cooperation between would-be tyrants and government with their counterparts in the tech industry could result in what I call outsourcing tyranny. This has already been demonstrated by internet censorship, search keyword manipulation, defunding, and deplatforming. We can expect these trends to escalate in the 20th and 2030s. Uh, plan accordingly. So one party says, speak up. On the other part, he says, they're going to cut you off at the legs, <laughs> the knees. Uh, so you got to choose what you're going to do. I, I think you want to be careful. Um, <laughs> speaking up, like right now, 90% of why what I'd like to say about survival and things happening in the future, I can't really say. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, this part is fascinating and it's, it's a constant debate about should you bug out or stay put. Um, I think a lot of people miss the point. It's more nuanced. It depends on the situation, on so many things. Primarily what is going on. If, if you have a total wipeout of society, you, I can see people going to a bug out location where they would rebuild society. You'd be like a pioneer in the wilderness. You're rebuilding society. Everybody's a level playing field. And, and if you have a community where you're living with other people in a rural area with a lot of resources and, and you could defend yourself, then that's an excellent choice. But what if you're, it's not completely wiped out and the government still exists, but the government is strong and central, but it's only strong enough to keep you down and it's not strong enough to to fight the, the really bad people out there but what if that government thinks you're a bad person you're you're a bitter clinger um you know you're you're a racist bitter clinger and you you're a hoarder because you have all this food stored and you have guns so you're a terrorist so 
And if you try to defend yourself, they're going to come after you. But they're not going to act, come after all the, the, the gangs and all these terrorist people who are out there that are actually doing bad things. Just if people are trying to protect themselves, you're going to be a, a bitter clinger living out there in the rural areas being picked off. In South Africa, since uh, Mandela came to power, I'm not blaming him, but since he came to power, over 3,000 white farmers and their families have been brutally killed. I, won't, I mean, in ways, you, you, the worst ways you can imagine, 3,000 of them, and living out rural areas by themselves, and they weren't able to defend themselves, even though, you know, they come from a long line of people who had weapons and so on. So, uh, yeah, if, if you still have the government that's around, and it's strong, central, totalitarian, and it sees you as an enemy or something that just a resource they can, they can prey on, um, you're you're going to be all by your lonesome out there in the in the rural areas. So, it, it's. I I I would rather be, maybe a bitter clinger in the city somewhere, where they couldn't find me than out there in the wilderness that, uh, that they knew I had a lot of stuff they could come get. So, um, it you, you it's different situations. So hopefully neither one of these will ever come to pass, but. It's just when you start arguing about these things, I think there's a lot of nuance. That there's a lot of things going on that you're not always talking about the same thing. Um, I also, I, I, I almost forgot that Mr. Ross, he does mention uh, in one part of his book about Rhodesia and then the uh, how it was uh, they were able to uh, defend themselves. He, he, so few people know about Rhodesia. And the things that happened there. I thought it was wonderful that he was able to mention that in his book. I, I respect him for that. Um, then he, he goes over uh, priorities, which we kind of talked about, and energy. I think... He did a pretty good job on energy. Now, at the very end, he mentioned this. He says, no matter where you live, a rural location with neighbors that share your mindset, forming a strong community is your best bet for safety. And I happen to believe that sincerely. A lot of people, they get involved in prepping and survival. They think it's just acquisition of material things that's going to help them survive. And they overlook their personal health, mental and physical. And they overlook that they're going to need other people to survive. You, you, you don't live alone. You, you live with other people. Um, you, Kurt Vonnegut, I, I watched him in a video. I wish I could find it. Years and years ago, he was interviewed. And Kurt Vonnegut said, in the future, everybody's going to need a gang. <laughs> I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. This had to be like the 1980s. Yeah, in the future, everybody's going to need a gang. And I think that's the key to survival. It isn't guns or bullets or beans or band-aids. It's a mindset and it's people. You're going to need other people. And what people should be doing isn't just developing uh, physical resources or technology. They should be working on developing a gang. I'm not talking criminal gang. I'm talking a gang, whether it's a church community or a social community or whatever. You need a group of like-minded people that will support your have your back. And, and that's the way you're going to survive. A lot of people, they uh, they have uh, really strong ethnic identities or tribal identities that help them um, survive because they've had to have those to survive. And I think in the future, people who don't have those are going to have to acquire them. They're, they're going to have to have a mindset of, of less individualism, or maybe not less individualism, but, but along with that, uh, a strong association with with belonging to another another group that is like-minded, that's going to help them. Otherwise, they're going to just be picked off, and and uh, there's safety in numbers. And a lot of Americans, they've been so individual, they've never been involved with with numbers. They've just been alone in the wilderness, you know. And it's I think they're going to have to change their mindset and and, and self-identify with with uh, with other people. The last part is he has some wonderful lists, and I thought his book list was very good too. 
By the way, I mentioned before I have a CD with some books, and some of these books are on the CDs. Um, some of my favorites in here are the When There's No Doctor, When There's a Dentist. There's also one here, Possum Living by Dolly Freed. I thought you can still find her books on places on, online uh, for free. But uh, if you can get it, I think she started and republished it. So uh, you could buy it from her on Amazon. That's a wonderful book. Uh, so that I, that's my, my, my review of this book. I recommend it. Um, I also think if you read it more than once, you're going to be surprised at all the stuff you didn't realize was there. Um, like I said, these lists are very good. And as if you're a beginner, you wouldn't want to start with this, but everything in here is something a beginner would benefit by learning and knowing. And if you're a person who knows a lot, there are some things in here that I had no idea um, and I, I, I benefited from. There's one about, uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it was, but it was about IBM Selectric typewriters. <laughs> he, he gave a hint about those that you could actually make some money off them, number one, and could be very helpful in the future, number two, that I hadn't seen any other places. Anytime you can buy a book and you get at least one good idea, it's worth the price because the author of a book has spent his life learning something and then he puts it down on paper. So you do not have to live that person's life to gain their wisdom and knowledge. You just have to buy their book. <laughs> so if you only get one or two good ideas, it's worth, and you're going to find more than one or two good ideas in this book. So would I recommend it? Yes. Um, I'm going to get his other books and do reviews on them in the future. So, um, you know, years ago, I, I reviewed this book. It's uh, by Barbara Ann Kipfer, 14,000 Things to Be Happy About. And I made a YouTube video. And a couple years later, Ms. Kipfer found the video I made. And she, she left a comment. She said that my review brought tears to her eyes. <laughs> Which was so sweet. One of the nice things that anybody said. I also was kind of funny that I would make someone who wrote 14 Things to Be Happy About actually cry. But, <laughs> but I'm hoping this, this review did not make Mr. Rawls cry. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt he'll even see it, but uh, it was it was a pleasure to read and review, and uh, I look forward to reviewing his other books too. And don't forget, it comes out October the twentieth. So if you do like this book and thinking about buying it, it would help him if you would do it on the twentieth. You can do it on Amazon through your link or the link I'll leave in the video description below. And don't forget to check out my CDs. Also check out my videos. I put on new videos every week on on YouTube. Been doing it for 13 years. Got over 840 videos. And uh, you never know what you what you actually do. You do you do know what you're going to find. I would do food on Fridays. I do reviews on Sunday, which is today. And on Wednesday, I do wild card. Anything I want. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care. Oh, this was something you found useful. And uh, get yourself a gang. See you out there.